I'm thrilled to be bringing you uh, some of the world leading experts. Dr. Megan Heron is a board member uh, of, as a board did, sorry, member of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists, the authority when it comes to pet behavior problems and the most difficult pet behavior problems. And Steve Dale, of course, who is a certified animal behaviorist and the 2020 recipient of the AVMA Excellence in Media Award to be. Uh, and thank you guys both for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you tonight about this book, Decoding Your Cat. Super excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. So we were just talking about this right before we went live, that people can't get it yet. Um, and uh, it's been pushed back just a little bit. Um, so it's going to be right. available in July. Is that right, Dr. Heron? Yeah, initially it was slated to come out June 21st, but it's been pushed back to July 21st uh, due to just minor crisis going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little so, bit. So, yeah, so I would come out electronically and in, in hardback on the 21st of July. I, I would like to jump in there because uh, and, and give some background to this, Dr. Bales. Uh, because yeah. this is like so exciting to me. And if you love cats, uh, could be and should be exciting to you too. Uh, Decoding Your Dog uh, was a book that was actually uh, my idea uh, several years ago. I could tell you later how that idea came about. But from the very beginning, and uh, perhaps Dr. Heron knows this or heard about this, I was uh, harassing the agent. You, you guys, I know, still have the same agent. I was yeah. harassing him. Actually, I wanted to do a cat book first. And, yes, I and do remember said, that. <laughs> yeah. And, and he said, no, 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 cat books don't sell. I said, what? And I gave him all kind of information about cat books, and they do sell. I, 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 <laughs> but he didn't care. So, so we did Decoding Your Dog, and my goodness, a couple things about that book. It was authored by Dr. Bales. You know about behavior. You have a special interest in behavior. My hope is that we'll get to talk about this is your how to feed cats. That we might be feeding them all wrong. Uh, and there's me, just a behavior consultant who talks on the radio and TV and stuff like that. I always have felt and continue to feel that at the top of the heap, at the top, at the I'm having trouble finding my hand, at the top of the mountain, in all seriousness, are the veterinary behaviors. Uh, they oftentimes do the research, Dr. Bales, that you and I talk about. Uh, they also can do something that you can do, Dr. Bales, that I cannot do. So someone can tell me about their cat thinking outside the litter box, and the first thing I say is, why now, if it's a new behavior? It may be medical, or at least in part medical. And that's where a veterinary behaviorist comes in also. And uh, prescribing pharmaceuticals that uh, they are on top of and know a lot about have actually, so, you know, friends, you know that for your own doctors, they may be boarded in cardiology or neurology or uh, ophthalmology. These, uh, the small group that's growing happily is boarded in animal behavior, which means they went to school 7,800 years. And uh, <laughs> fair, fair saying. So you have to go to regular college and get all kinds of classes under your belt and then take a bunch of hard tests. And then you go to veterinary school for four years and you take a bunch more hard tests. And then you have to pass your veterinary board exams. And then you have to do a, at least three year residency. Now, tell me about the requirements, Dr. Heron, to be uh, a boarded behaviorist. Yeah, so after four years of veterinary school, then you have to do a year long internship or equivalent in general medicine. Because again, as behaviorists, we are veterinarians as well. And so that year of experience in general medicine um, is super important before starting that residency. Most residencies are a minimum of three years. Mine was three years. Some take a little longer. Um, and then you study hard and take a really, really, really big test at the end <laughs> um, to become board certified and member of the American College of Veterinary Behaviors. And you also have to do some research projects that are grueling. Yeah, so you have to do a research project that has to be published in order to sit for boards. Um, and then you have to uh, also produce three 
pretty rigorous case reports. I mean, you gotta you gotta prove it. You know what you're talking about before you're gonna get those letters. So I think it does. It does. You know, I said science matters. When we started tonight, and science matters more and more to me every single day. Um, and I think that it, it really does make a difference of someone's opinion, someone's personal experience. And then understanding the difference between uh, those things and then vast amounts of schooling, learning, researching, uh, writing, test taking to get to where you are. Um, Science matters. And so that's why you were selected to be the editor of this book. Yes, so I'm the lead editor. I have two co-editors, Dr. Carlos Siracusa and Dr. Debbie Horwitz. So Deborah was actually lead editor on Decoding Your Cat. And so it's been an honor to join the editing team and take the lead for Decoding Your Cat. I mean, really quite a privilege um, just to work with my colleagues at the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. I mean, everyone's an expert in their own right. And there are so many of them coming together for this book. It's really a masterpiece. So, so yeah, so this is the first time, first time ever, except Decoding Your Dog was really the first time, where <laughs> members of the college got together and wrote uh, a book for the general public. So here are the experts who are the ultimate experts, in my opinion, in animal behavior. And each took a chapter, some chapters you have two authors, and said, okay, we're going to write about this. And not only that, they, you guys don't write about it in scientific terms, you use science, but write it in a way that people can understand. It's easy to read. You could pick it up in the middle of the book. You could pick it up on a chapter on older cats, for example, if that's your question or that's your issue. And you know, here's where I wanna start, Dr. Heron. I actually do believe, and I'm very proud of Decoding Your Dog. It sold very well. As I said, it was greatly, I'll take credit, my idea, you know. I was very happy about it. I am very happy about it. But the book I just held up, Decoding Your Cat, to me has more value potentially than Decoding Your Dog. What do you think? Well, I am a little biased, <laughs> but um, I, I think cats are, are one of our most misunderstood pets, right? Um, because they are neither a human in a furry coat, um, nor a dog in a smaller body, right? And so I think a lot of times your average pet owner tries to put those two together and they're very, very different. And that's a result of genetics, it's a result of hundreds of thousands or hundreds of years, thousands of years of domestication or lack thereof when it comes to cats. So they're a very different species. Um, and I, I think it's gonna have a lot of impact to bring together the science behind behavior as well as that veterinarian point of view. So being able to come together and provide our, our cat families with information that's scientifically sound, coming from experts, as you say, thank you, Steve, for being our biggest cheerleader, um, and, and information that's really going to provide for the best physical and mental well-being and longevity of our cats. Uh, you know, uh, there's, I think when it comes to dogs, we actually better understand dogs than cats. And I think there are so many misconceptions. They're, they're out there for dogs too. And one of the reasons why we did Decoding Your Dog, at that time there was a dog trainer on TV, Caesar or something or another, who was talking about uh, using intimidation uh, and, and said, we have to be dominant over our dogs. And we wanted to dispel all that. And, and we did, I should say you did as, as the members of the college. Uh, I would argue that there's this, I could go through them. This misconception, that misconception, I mean, there's, I could literally name 15, just off the top of my head, misconceptions that I think even experienced cat owners may have about cats. Yeah, absolutely. So you broke up for most of that, Steve. <laughs> I heard, I think the people at home heard you. We, we are all okay. having our different internet challenges. It's like a, a collage of tech troubles. But Dr. Heron, tell me, you, you, Steve was talking about the misconceptions of cats that people have about cats. And you know, you said they're not a small person, they're not a small dog. And, and you touched on it just a second ago with domestication. So can you talk a little bit about how the, the innate nature of cats is very different than dogs and why, why that is? 
Sure. So I was at the Ohio State University uh, College of Veterinary Medicine for just over a decade, and I had the privilege of teaching our first year veterinary students, um, often on day one, their very first day of veterinary oh, school. Hi. I got to see this smile on the face. And um, it was one of my favorite lectures. We talked about the process of domestication, you know, when we select for certain traits, um, namely docility, easy habitats, easy to feed, um, and that that's going to make them conducive to becoming a domesticated species, whether that's cattle, whether that's pigs, whether that's chickens, cats, dogs. Um, and what's really fun is when you look at sort of the wild ancestor. So what does that animal look like compared to today's pet animal or domestic animal? Um, and you walk through the difference. So um, Looking at you know the wolf ancestor compared to a lot of the other, well, there's the neotenous breeds or those with the big eyes. I have a French bulldog myself, so <laughs> can you get any different than the wild ancestor in, in the canine <laughs> breed? No, um, or or chickens, you know, coming from you know the red jungle fowl, very very different species, different animal. And then I my last thing to go through is the cat, and so I hold a picture and I should, we should prepare it and have this up for our audience, but a picture of, you know, whether you're looking at Felis sylvestris or Felis libica, still a little bit up for debate, but the wild ancestor of today's domestic cat, the next to today's cat, not many people can tell the difference. They look exactly the same. I need to get a picture while we're talking. <laughs> okay, so while she's looking that up, uh, we have a hello from Kristen, so hello, Kristen. Uh, also, I have a text right here from a friend of a friend who said, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to ask, but you mentioned missing the litter box. That is exactly what my cat is starting to do. Does it have anything to do with us being home all the time? Does our cat, does our cat really want us to get back to work? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is a great question. And I think our pets are just bewildered at why the heck we just don't get lost. <laughs> Especially cats, maybe. Yeah, well, I think cats are very sensitive to change, um, as are many people. And we disrupt that routine, even though we, we like to think our cats love us and want to be around us and having even more of us would be a, a good thing for them. It's still a change, nevertheless. And that can sometimes upset um, litter box habits, depending. Um, I always, always, whenever I hear of a, a new behavior concerning cats, especially revolving the litter box, that want to make sure that's not a medical reason for that. Um, when I was in general practice, uh, before my residency, I saw a cat peeing outside the litter box probably every day. Liz, you can probably relate to that every day. All right, what is it? And everybody's coming to me. All right, my cat's peeing out of the box. He's mad at me. Give me the Prozac. And I, in general practice, eight out of 10 times, it, it was a medical reason. We found a urinary tract infection. We found a bladder stone. We found an anal gland problem, constipation, you know, issues in the rear end. Something was making that cat either uncomfortable going to the bathroom or uncomfortable getting to that litter box. So I checked that out first for sure. If all that's checking out good, then I, I would not be surprised if the, the upset of routine and the, the changes would be contributing to that, particularly in households with children. Right, I own household has a four and six year old and my poor dogs and cats. <laughs> I mean, they just can't get away, right? Our kids are socially isolated from their friends. They have very little or limited social outlet besides their parents and their pets are way more fun than we are. And so they're getting way more attention and affection, potentially unwanted um, from a lot of members of the family and with children that can, that can be stressful. Um, so particularly for cats and you know, whether they're getting dressed up in clothes, pet carried around, I can see that causing a stress-related urinary problem. And you know, one of the things that is a subject that I spend a lot of time talking about is in cats, the risk of a actual bacteria, bacteria urinary tract infection is very, very low. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other things that it is. And when people see those urinary signs, the first thing that, that they think is UTI and antibiotics. And you just mentioned, you know, there's a lot of other medical problems that it could be, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the behavioral component. So there's no way to tell just by looking at your cat, whether it's the medical problem or the behavioral right. problem. And that's why that vet visit is so important. That and is very true. And even if you're seeing, you know, cats that there's so many disease processes that are both 
mental and physical, right? So you can have stress-related physical problems um, in our cats as well. And so it's really important to look at that cat as a whole. And I think right now with, with everyone being home and the routines being changed and our stress levels are high, uh, the odds of things happening that could cause a urinary issue are higher. I I'm hearing about it more, I'm seeing it more. So I think we can do a PSA for uh, the male cats of America. And would you describe what people should look for and what, what would make you think this is something that needs to be taken care of? Well, I would say any any change in behavior, particularly an abrupt change in behavior and urination habits, a cat that has routinely used its litter box without an issue for years is suddenly peeing outside of it, uh, whether that's right next to the box or on the owner's bed or in the middle of the floor, an abrupt change like that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, is that really screams of a medical problem, whether that's pain or an increase volume of urine because there's a disease process causing them to drink more than they should, um, or again, the GI tract, or, or really anything, the skin, right? I, I had cases where we had flea allergy dermatitis. One flea bit a cat and they stopped using the litter box appropriately, right? We're coming into spring and summer season now, so that may be an issue as well. Um, you also wanna look for cats and uh, other changes, um, not just related to the litter box. So social withdrawal, or increased sudden attention seeking that wasn't there before. Why are our cats trying to get our attention? They're rubbing on us, they're batting at us, they're trying to get more attention. Um, you also may see them resting in areas they hadn't before. So a lack of jumping up, particularly to purchase. Higher resting places, access if food bowls are kept up higher or litter boxes are kept up high away from dogs or children um, and they're not accessing that as well. Um, you're, gonna see, you're gonna see that. Watching their eating habits. Are they eating more? Are they eating less? Uh, looking for those little piles of regurgitated food or or vomit that can happen. Uh, all of these things can 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 be changes. And I think now that we're home, I'm hoping people are noticing these things more than they might they might have before, because often they're very subtle, slight change in food intake, a um, little bit of vomit here and there, a little bit of social withdrawal, um, and not noticing that they're jumping up. So it can be very subtle. So hopefully people can notice that more that they're home. I have uh, two questions here. First off, we have two special guests. One is on the screen, uh, Dr. Bales, who are we looking at? That is Felis Silvestris, the thought to be the ancestor of all domestic cats. I didn't know there was still a controversy. I think it's most people are landing on Silvestris at the time, but I'd say if you look even three, four, like whatever, I guess it's been a whole decade since I've been teaching my course. But when I first started the course, you know, there was still some school of thought that Felis Libicum may have been. Um, at least in part ancestor. Part of the plan. All right, great. And, I learned and the second special guest that I want to say hello to is Dr. Amy Pike, who is watching this. Uh, a colleague of yours, Dr. Heron, a veterinary behaviorist. Mm -hmm. I have an 11 year old rescue dreamsicle. I don't know what that is, who has been with me four years. Uh, the first time in two weeks, she allows me to pick her up and uh, hold her without hissing. So one of the questions that I get a lot, and I bet both of you do too, is I'm petting my cat and my cat nails me. What's wrong? I just want to pet my cat. Maybe this cat's getting a little better. That's a common question I suspect, Dr. Heron. And I know that question is answered in this book, but we'll cheat. <laughs> you can answer right now. And then uh, Dr. Bales can add to it. Yeah, sure. So I'm reading that right now. There's so much in that just short message that says a lot. Um, so, so first of all, let's talk about, so I've had a cat, 11 years old, I've had for four years, so rescue, meaning came from, whether it's a shelter, or rescue abandoned, so or potentially living out semi, in a semi-feral environment, so not really living among people. So for four years, this is the first time two weeks ago, allowing me to pick her up and hold her without hissing. So let me start with the hissing. So hissing means one thing, one and only, it means fear, I'm afraid. It's signaling I'm feeling fearful, whether it's I'm feeling painful or afraid or I don't know what's going to happen next. That's, that's what hissing means. I know I remember I had an owner once who would get so upset. So he said every time he came home from work, he'd put down his keys, drop his coat and his cat would hiss at him. And so he'd pick up that newspaper and he said, 
I'm the one that feeds you. I'm the one that scoops your litter box. And she kept hissing. It's like she was giving me the middle finger every time I came home. <laughs> and I had explained this is actually quite it's not the middle finger at all. She was just saying she was afraid. And the more we start, you know, using force to to address our cats like this, the more fear we're going to create, the more likely that hissing is going to happen. And so we we changed that outlook and help to give him some empathy for his cat to see, oh, this cat's afraid. Maybe I shouldn't behave in a way that's not scary. And over time, that hissing greatly decreased. Um, what I suspect um, are, was it Rich here? Yes, Rich. He's talking about his cat. Um, I, I'm wondering if this was a semi-feral cat. And some of these cats can really take a long time. When they're obtained, when, they're, when you try to involve a or introduce social interactions with people to an adult cat who really hasn't had much of that as a kitten, it can be a really slow and difficult process. And in some cases, it's not it's not possible. But I, I suspect if, if we've been home more and our cats are learning to be around us, nothing bad is happening. Actually, quite a few good things are happening, particularly if Rich has been very patient, not pushing the issue, not forcing the issue, not forcing those interactions. And over time, she's, she's come to realize, she had more opportunity to realize that He's actually a safe person and that these interactions are, are pleasant. Um, we can see that happen. I suspect that may be what is going on here over the past two weeks. Dr. Bale, you want to add to that? Yeah, and I think that is a great summary. The, the only other thing I was thinking is if it's a sudden change that she's allowing you to pick her up, is anything else changing too? Has she lost weight, gained weight, um, any other sure. changes? that could say that maybe she is more docile because she's not feeling great. Um, but behaviorally, I know I just, I totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. yeah the hissing part too, I would say, yeah, you're, you've got a point. She's not running away if she's not feeling well or she's painful, but, but the hissing is a good sign that, I mean, that's it's one of their first go-tos when they're feeling afraid. So her stopping that is, is a good sign. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I think it's mm -hmm. sort of counterintuitive, but people who have, sick pets that allow them to, the pet is just lethargic, so they allow them to get more interact, human interaction than a healthy pet would. Yeah. Um, sometimes we see that as a good thing, but that it might not necessarily be a good thing. So yeah, it's kind of, point. yeah. And we have a second question that actually, it's from Sambra. I'm not gonna read the entire question, but much of it is like, the question I just asked, and this cat attacks often and is always unprovoked. I wonder, Dr. Heron, if it's unprovoked from the cat's perspective, though. She is incredibly skittish, refuses getting petted unless she's sleepy. Even if I place food in her bowl, she'll hiss and smack at me as, as I'm uh, feeding. Do you have a comment on that? And are there some things she can do to train, quote unquote, the cat to be more tolerant of petting? Anxious cat, I'm thinking maybe pheromone products, maybe a nutraceutical product just to tone down the anxiety. But from there, it's you. <laughs> yeah, I, again, I think this goes back to that common misconception about hissing being a sign that cat is giving you the middle finger or being quote unquote mean and, and really that hissing stems from fear. And it sounds like this kitten, if she got, depending on what, what age she got her, she's been afraid of, of people her whole life and she's signaling back off, right? If, and it, it's really hard for us as people and humans because we want to interact in a way that's physical, that shows affection, that ventral contact of hugging, holding clothes, making eye contact, face to face, hand over head. This is how we show affection to members of our own species. And we assume that's the way other species want to receive it. But but in a lot of cases, and especially in cats, you know, either they weren't well socialized that as at a very young age, and by young age, I mean six to eight weeks, right? We need that exposure very young um, in order for them to know that it is indeed a safe interaction and nothing bad is going to happen to them. Um, and it, it's also possible that you know, just ge genetically, this is a cat with a more fearful temperament. It's certainly also possible, again, if, if something uncomfortable, if she has a physical problem saying that when you touch me, it hurts, and I've learned that it might hurt me when you touch me, and so she's being proactive by saying, back off, please don't pet me here. Um, but what we find is that with our repeated attempts to be friendly and our repeated attempts to show that we're, we mean well, it's misinterpreted by the cat. 
as you say, unprovoked from the cat's point of view, Steve, um, she's feeling that her space is being invaded. She's feeling like she's sending signals with hissing and swatting at, hey, I'm not comfortable, please back away. And by continuing to try to show that affection, the cat's not receiving that message as one of friendliness, it's receiving it as one of a threat. And so there's a lot we can do to try to mend that relationship and really work on giving as a, as a, Sambra with her cat, I don't see her kitty's name um, on the post, but hopefully increasing that bond there. But the first place to start is to is to back off, to really, that's the hardest piece of advice I ever give any of my pet families is to back off, stop the affection, stop trying to be friendly, at least in a human way. Um, that's the hardest thing because what we've got to know, that cat needs to learn to trust that when you're around, you're not going to force the issue. And over time, if they realize that, oh, we've been in the same room together, you haven't reached for me, you haven't tried to grab me or pick me up, they're going to start to get closer and closer and closer just by a natural sort of habituation. We can then maximize that and really accelerate the progress of that bond mending through the use of uh, counter conditioning. Counter conditioning is a process where we change a negative emotional response into a positive one by associating those with something that the cat naturally loves or enjoys. And with cats, I say those top two things are food and play with toys. And again, every single cat's gonna have a different preference. One's gonna like food over another. One cat's gonna love a certain food and hate everything else. <laughs> and some cats are gonna love certain types of toys and others are not. So you really have to do some preference testing. So maybe think about, have you noticed your cat uh, just seems to have an inkling for a certain favorite toy, whether that's a wand toy. I think a cat who seems to be fearful, maybe is hissing and swatting and not comfortable with proximity to people. One of the wand toys or one of those toys that actually puts distance between you and the cat so that the cat can play and engage in a really fun activity without being super close. And over time, if they see that oh, this person is always playing with my favorite toy, three, four, five, six times a day, we have this great interaction. You're gonna start to see that emotion rub off on the person. And so that person equals toy, which equals fun, which equals pleasure and pleasant emotions. I always say pleasant emotions are gonna equal pleasant behavior. So we have to work on that. Or utilizing food and tossing these treats away from you and allowing that cat to come out, eat the treats and walk away. Over time, you get them closer and closer and closer to yourself. Um, so that they're willing to come and build trust and, and take that food out of your hand. And then over time, because we all, a lot of us, we have these furry pets because we want to touch them. We want to pet them. We want to we want to cuddle them. And every cat's going to have a line in the sand that's, that's different. And some cats may have a line in the sand that says, no, you're never going to be able to pick me up and squeeze me. And that's okay. It doesn't mean it's a bad cat or that you're a bad cat family. It just means that's what, that's your cat's individual preference. And so what I often like to introduce is to teaching them more when we get into the realm of operate conditioning or, or basic training is I like to teach them a, a target. So I touch my finger or touch the end of say a pencil if a finger is too hard and just teach them, yes, come and touch your, oh, here you can see my hand. <laughs> touch your nose to my finger. It's kind of like an invitation, are you interested? And so we say touch, we reach our little finger out. If they touch it, they get a little treat, they get a little toy. And then over time, if they've learned what this cue means, they see this finger and we say touch, it's kind of like a red light or green light. All right, you touch my finger. Now I'm gonna gently take one or two fingers and I'm just gonna to touch you on the cheek or the, the side of the head. That's gonna be the most comfortable place if you're gonna first start introducing touch to, to cats you aren't used to it or comfortable with, it's gonna be the head and the neck. We wanna avoid those long strokes down the back and tail because that can be uncomfortable for some cats. And it's just not how cats touch each other. If you watch them groom each other, they lick around the head and the face mostly. They're not doing these long strokes down the body necessarily. So starting with kind of a signal interaction and then really just introducing brief, brief, minimal petting at the at the head and neck and otherwise staying hands off, which again, I recognize is the hardest advice to take and to give. This is so cool. We just got CE here. Uh, <laughs> but really it's all, and it's all in the book uh, that I, I didn't say this, but I wrote the introduction to this book, which I'm honor to have done. The next question, Dr. Bales, is about a cat who lives for food. And well, you know, I'm gonna, I, I was just trying, I have a video here of, oh. uh, but I'm not, I, I can't find it quickly enough. So I'm gonna dash mm -hmm. that. Uh, but if you look, if you scroll down when we're finished, I've been working on target training with my oh, cat. Okay, so, yeah. Okay. 
if you scroll down on um, on the Doc Liz Bales page, you'll be able to see some target training and what that looks like. Um, but you're about to introduce um, Hillary Israel, and I'm going to out her that she's a veterinarian, and she is a dear friend of mine and a classmate, one of the smartest people I know. Yes, Hillary, you are. Um, and this cat that she has, I'm going to say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Hillary, I think he's about two. I know him rather well, and he is really a curiosity. Um, he, she does everything right with him. She has all the stimulation. He hunts for his food. He, um, has places to find places to hide, but this cat, she'll send me regular videos or pictures of him. Um, he gets into any and every kind of food and is insatiable and he's young. He's a, he's a Maine Coon. He's a big lanky Maine Coon, purebred Maine Coon. Um, and I don't, I, I've done everything I know for this cat. So if you've got some great ideas, I would love to hear them because it's, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I think I'm probably telling tales out of school, but I think he has had one foreign body surgery, yeah. um, but it's anything. It's like, she says here, heads of cauliflower, um, entire muffins. If he gets into her pantry, it's just looks like she's been ransacked. So, um, what ideas do you have? Wow, that's interesting. So I have I have lived with cats, maybe not quite to that extreme, Hillary. That sounds I mean, get it breaking into the pantry and, and ripping things open. That's 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 more than I love it. But I had a I actually had a Sphinx um for five years who he I was marinating food in a silver a stainless steel bowl up on the top of my counter and he removed one by one the vegetables and the meat just out of the bowl and took them elsewhere, ate them. He stole a stick of butter off of the dinner table. Um he got my olives, green peppers out of the trash from a, a sandwich I had thrown away. I mean, these cats are <laughs> just crazy. So, and he was, a, he was a really, he was a sphinx that so he was, he was a rescue. And some of these cats, we, we, it's, it's not necessarily about hunger. Dr. Buffington loves to talk about uh, these cats. They're not hungry, <laughs> but I don't know. I think that's hard um, because you have cats and I'm assuming Hillary as a veterinarian has a cat in a perfect body condition. So meaning not overweight, not underweight. So we yes. have these cats that are at a uh, perfect body condition. Um, they are fed quality diets with high fiber contests. I mean, Dr. Bales can talk all about the new diets that are out there right now to help satiate cats and keep their metabolism sort of in, in perfect measure. Um, yet they seem unsatiated. We cannot, we cannot keep them full. And I think some of that is coming from, I think there has to be some early programming in some of these cats. Like I, I can't help but wonder, and I, I see this in dogs as well, like what was going on? And with a Maine Coon, you mentioned, there's gotta be some pretty rapid growth because these cats are big and they grow pretty quickly at a young rate. So is there a, a history in this, you know, somewhere in this cats as, as the body was growing so rapidly, there is a memory there that I need to eat, I need to eat, I need to eat. And even though at this point, you know, the cat's in great body condition, I, I can't help but wonder if there's a period of time at a young age, if they something got implanted in their brain that said, I need to continue to seek food. It's also part of these, these are cats with a very, very strong hunting instinct, right? As we talk about this felis Sylvester's here on the screen, and these are hunters. Right? They, they they survive not by a bowl of cat food, they survive by hunting. So part of it is I want to eat, I want to find this food, I want to I want to hunt it, I want to eat it. But I also it's that drive to work for it, right? And so it's probably actually pretty enriching for that cat to break into a pantry <laughs> and to try to seek out that food. It's, it's, so it's kind of that daily challenge because a lot of these guys are pretty smart and they figure it out. And poor Dr. Israel is actually doing that too. So she was one of my early adopters for the hunting feeder. So talk, he gets, he gets. Talk about that. Talk about that because, you know, it may not have helped this particular one in a hundred person, but for most people in my experience, Dr. Bales, with this sort of issue, uh, your indoor hunting feeder is uh, a solution. And there is tons of information here on enrichment. And, and to me, well, it's important we enrich our dogs' lives. We have a nation filled, I think, with uh, underemployed or unemployed dogs. Uh, we also have a nation filled with brain dead fat cats. And it doesn't have to be that way. So explain uh, what this is and how you feel about how we're feeding our cats. So my, it's, it's not so much what I feel, but what I was taught. 
um, back in school, uh, starting in 1996 with Dr. Karen Overall. And then in my continued education through my career, of I, I was really uh, focused on cat uh, behavior and, and sort of what you were talking about earlier of how for a cat hunting and behavior really weaves through almost every medical condition that cats uh, end up with. Uh, and and their, their sequence of hunt, catch, play, eat, multiple small meals a day. So uh, it, the direct relationship with this Felis Silvestris, uh, the cat that's living feral in your park is really no different than the one that's in your house. Uh, and that cat is hunting, catching, playing with and eating uh, eight to 12 mice every single day just to sustain life, which means they need to have this incredible prey drive and be uh, really game to hunt all the time. And that works for them when they need to get their food outside. But when we bring them inside, we kind of, I mean, a cat, I, I, I have a new cat um, who she's a, she's a rag doll and she's the prettiest thing in the entire world, but she is a hunter. It's been so fun because my other cats were adults to have a kitten around again. Um, this need to every single thing about her behavior, now that I'm looking for that, is about hunting, zeroing in on something, anything that moves, the pounce. Um, and in normal households, we take away every single opportunity for a cat to do this. We put the food in the bowl once or twice a day, and that's that. Um, and so, and actually Dr. Syracusa, who, who you talked about in this book is another dear friend of mine. Uh, and he, he, he said to me years ago that mealtime is not just about food for a cat. They must have the predatory drive, instinct, and sensation along with the meal to be really satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no way to do that. So that's how I came up with the idea of like, why not? I never expected to do this, to do, to be a product person, um, but no one else did. And why we didn't, it seems so simple. Hunt, catch, play, eat multiple times a day, a tiny thing that a cat can use their teeth and claws, move around if they want to. And it's in a different part of the house every day. That's what a mouse is. So I, I like to joke that I'm the, either the smartest dumb person, the dumbest smart person, I'm not sure. And it's kind of a duh. Um, but I just gave it back. So you have portion control, you have exercise and you let your cat have that predatory instinct at least six times a day. Um, and coming soon, uh, I have a wet feeder that I labored over for five years. Um, it's hard not to make it to meet all the needs. Cause what I now know after, um, working with the public for five years with products, if the people don't like it, the cat never gets it. So um, finding something that people like and a cat will like for wet food, yeah. not, not easy. So uh, that's going to be long. It should be out now, but it isn't. It's I think it's with your book on a boat somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm completely passionate about uh, finding the physical solution to meet cats problems. Um, and help them be able to express their instincts in the home. And I'm just wanting to give all my credit to Dr. Israel because she's doing all of those things. There's not enough hunting in the world for this cat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, that's why I say is there something that's ingrained early on um, that maybe maybe why her cat's not responding as you should, because typically, you know, my average, when I was seeing my cat clients at Ohio State, you know, it, it was it was like you said, it was two meals in a, in a bowl or just one that's left out all day. Um, and so there was none of that seeking behavior, none of that hunting behavior, right? There's planning, there's plotting, there's stalking, there's grabbing, there's playing, dangle, right? How many of your cats have ever actually caught, have caught a mouse? How many of their times they actually killed it? Not many. Mine just like to play with it. It's pretty awful, <laughs> but it's, that's part of the process, right? It's, it's engaging, it's interacting, it's using their brain, it's using their claws, it's being physical. It's so healthy for them to engage in all these activities. So that's so I I like that. And our book talks a lot about, I mean, you know, we do have a chapter called The Feline Dream Home, which is all about enrichment, but really enrichment is just draped throughout every chapter of this book because you can't separate it. It's such an important factor in feline mental and physical health. And, and you know, dogs and cats, like we talked about, are really different. But I think this is a really unique moment in time where people can appreciate cabin fever. So mm -hmm. we think of our homes as these great places, right? I've got this comfortable bed and this television, but it's, at a certain point, it starts to feel like a cage. Mm 
Yeah. So uh, imagine if that cage didn't have any of your stuff that you need to be happy and mm -hmm. you can't get what you need. Mm -hmm. um, it makes perfect sense that it starts to lead to some pretty serious problems. Right. right. And the other thing is we, my husband and I, we, we enjoy cooking, but we're really, we fight over like who gets to do the cooking <laughs> we have time because that's our enrichment. Right. And, you know, take that as great. We love our local restaurants for big foodies, but it's just delivered to you. There's no fun. There's nothing that's occupying our time to actually cut the vegetables and clon and plot and plot. Like, and, uh, you know, putting that together, it's, it's the same thing. Our brains need that stimulation and in our food preparation, just like our cats. So um, Jill says that she likes my T-shirt. Thank you very much, Jill. I love it. It's from the uh, American College of Veterinary Behaviors. And I, it was designed by one of your colleagues, I believe, or two of your colleagues. Uh, also, Carlos Siracusa is on this call. It's amazing. Uh, or it's on the, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> that's a wonderful person and an amazing doctor. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, I have a female cat that I fostered and mom with siblings. I do have other cats and dogs. So she was raised with other cats. I ended up accepting her. Adopting, adopting her. her. Sorry. Adopting her as she got older. She started peeing in different places. I've taken her to the veterinarian. All is good, uh, the veterinarian says, but just doesn't like other cats. On medication, we don't know which one but doesn't seem to work. She is six now, I assume six years, and a big baby only wants attention for herself. I don't know what to do with her. Hopefully we can answer your question, Janelle. Yeah. Well, first of all, Janelle, I'm very glad you took uh, her to the vet to make sure that the pain outside the box is not a physical problem. And hopefully your vet did a full exam, some blood work, some urine tests. I mean, you, I, you'd be surprised. I have a lot of cats present to me who never had a, their urine checked, even though they've been peeing outside their box for a while. So hopefully your, your vet did all a thorough investigation of that. And, you know, it sounds like you've got, you've got a big heart here and you are fostering dogs and cats. And every cat is different. She came to you. Sounds like her and mom. So you had her mom and her siblings. So she she was raised with other cats, which is great. But some of these cats, despite having that early social exposure, still struggle to live in a multi-animal household, particularly with dogs. So other cats are one hurdle. Then we have cats outside of her mom and litter mates. Then we have dogs and we have people. And it's possible that she's just just that personality type on, on that shire side that just hasn't had the opportunity to learn that all three of those extra uh, species or, or other beings in, in your household are indeed safe to her. So she's trying to seclude herself in different parts of the house. And we will often see cats that will urinate. And again, whether this is a, a marking behavior, so cats will mark by you know purposely depositing some urine in certain socially significant places as sending a message. They're feeling uncomfortable or for other way or they she could just be just too shy to be able to access the litter box and she's actually toileting um, where she is so, so so many questions we need to ask to get to the bottom of that but I'd say if she's trying to kind of want get attention away from everyone else then I would find her a haven let's create a safe haven for her that has all of her needs that only she can access so they make great microchip activated cat doors um, I prefer the microchip activated type not the collar type because collars fall off and if they don't fall off easily then they're probably too tight and they're a choking hazard so they are microchip activated cat doors so that she can have access to a room if you're willing to put a small hole in a door whether that's to a um, a large closet whether that's to a bathroom to a bedroom I, i'd love it to be a room with lots of space where she can have access to dry food wet food water fountains purchase that purchase access that great outdoors through a window um, and then also give you the opportunity and, and litter boxes clearly um, and you may have to experiment with different types of litter to see if she if she's having has a certain preference that may be part of the problem for peeing. But again, that's that's um, kind of a whole nother discussion. Um, scratching posts. I mean, there's just there's so many things you can offer to her to enrich her life. It seems counterintuitive if she's shy and, and we're going to shut her away, but we're really not. We're, we're just giving her access to make the choice to sequester herself in a very well enriched environment. And then also for you to spend time with her. So you can go in that room and just sit, 
sit on the floor, sit in a chair, sit on a bed and just be there. If you need to do some work on a computer, bring your laptop in, get your copy of Decoding Your Cat and sit and read <laughs> one chapter a day. Just be, let her get used to your presence and let her look forward to being there. And again, introduce yourself with toys and, and treats. And I would first work on the human bond, work on her bond with you so she builds that trust. And then one by one, if you want to try to introduce her to other animals, it needs to be on her terms and very slowly through a barrier where she has the ability and choice to stay away if she chooses, and that we can associate seeing maybe the other cats or the other dog one at a time on the other side of a baby gate, being rewarded with food for calm behavior. She can lick some food off of a plate or play with her favorite toys just by seeing those other animals. And over time, we can work up to, to building trust. She'd probably benefit from the, some of the pheromone products. So um, siva has got some great products out there. Um, there's Feel Away Multi-Cat, which is a newer product. So it mimics the feline appeasing pheromone that a mother cat's gonna um, release from her mammary chain when she's nursing kittens, which should have a calming effect. And it is really marketed to promote sort of social harmony uh, between cats. And so that might be, if you're looking for social harmony in your household, it might be a good idea to look into a Feel Away Multi-Cat Diffuser, which is a little plug-in Glade Diffuser. You have to just change out the cartridge once a month. Um, I'd have, um, have those in the areas where she may have to at least have visual, um, if not physical contact with other animals in the household. If you're gonna create that haven for her, you might think about a Feel Away um, classic diffuser there. So that, that the feel like um, classic actually mimics what cats are going to release from their cheek pheromones, which cats will mark when they rub on you. We call that bunting. So they rub their cheeks on you, on furniture, and they walk around the room sort of rubbing their cheeks on things. They're actually leaving a message on all of those items saying, I've been here. It's safe. I feel comfortable. And it helps them feel at ease and familiar. And so if we can utilize that pheromone in her safe haven, it's really gonna help enhance her comfort in that room um, and then utilizing those products. And I could go on and on, but hopefully those are a few tips to get you started. You know, I wanted to, to go back to the very beginning of this um, this conversation with, with this cat, because one of the things that I find cat lovers want is lots of cats. And they do not like to, um, I'm trying to find nice words to say these things, but uh, talk about limits on cats. And and it's I want to uh, get back to the innate behavior of cats, which is where I start and, and gives me the ability to understand almost everything. Uh, and cat social structure is what I'm getting at. So um, for for cats to live with a group is a choice, first of all. And that group is almost always related mothers and kittens. And territory is really important. So if your cat comes into your house and doesn't have housemates, uh, or comes in with a certain social structure in your house, that to you, you're not even thinking about those things because it's so different than people. But to that cat, it's very important. And then you bring in another cat that's not the way they see the world to, to accept that cat as their new BFF. To, to, to that cat, this is my territory. I don't do friends and I'm never going to be your friend. Um, and so to kind of Jedi mind trick them into being able to accept one another and ultimately be friends takes that kind of work you were talking about, but it, it's not innate for stranger cats to live together all of a sudden. Yeah, I think the more time you take, uh, the better off you are. And I actually, I kid, I half kid people. I say plan for six months because I believe then people will think, okay, maybe two months, you know. So it's kind of like what some of the governors are saying now. I think <laughs> we're going to go all the way to June, but they know darn well they'll be happy going till the end of May or something like that. Uh, what's happened to my laptop is uh, – <laughs> The battery's gone from 90% to 6%. So oh dear. fails while I plug in, I'll let you take over. Okay. I just think when we when we think about getting a second cat, don't think that it's because your cat needs a friend. The only instance where that tends to work well is litter mates, uh, young cats that are litter mates. Um, what other advice do you have about that my cat needs a friend phenomenon? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think the social preferences for cats are gonna depend a lot on what they had as a young kitten and what they kind of grew up through adolescence. And if they were taken away from mom and litter mates at six weeks of age and did not live with another cat, 
for years, it's going to be very hard for them to feel comfortable and be accepting of another cat coming into their home. They are not looking for a friend. They are looking to you as their family for friends. That might be different from, say, a cat that was raised with litter mates for several months and is used to having that constant interaction, feline interaction that is unique to how cats play with each other. We just can't mimic that as a, as a human. Um, then if they are suddenly taken from that social environment and made a singleton, then those are cats that might actually appreciate um, the company of another cat and more likely to be another young cat. Um, and so the only time I, you know, when we have kittens that are really, really social and they are stucking and playing and driving their humans crazy, that's probably the only time where I say, okay, what well, might, might help this problem is actually getting another kitten, another socially driven young cat. And, you know, from what we know about cats, the likelihood of getting along is relatedness and familiarity and being young. So if you really want to be a multi-cat household, think about getting litter mates or think about getting two very young kittens from different litters that are a similar age group, um, because that's gonna have the highest likelihood and that that brain, sort of the, the social sponge of, or that the, the kind of ability to socialize and to want to be with other cats, it needs to really establish when they're, when they're fairly young. So Rich is back with a, a saying that his cat loves YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> How, how do you feel about cats and iPad games or cats and television? Oh, um, as every behavior said, it's gonna, it always depends. <laughs> so I think I've seen some pretty cool interactive um, games on an iPad where they bat around and when they actually touch it, it, it goes away. Um, and I think that's probably a lot of these are, are they're more entertaining for humans and they're probably gonna lose their luster for cats after a while if that's the only entertainment they're giving. But but every once in a while, if it's a it's part of the repertoire of your whole enrichment portfolio, I, I think it can't hurt and can certainly be fun. Um, I think for television, now that we, you know, we've had HD TVs for a decade now, um, it, it's real life, right? These pictures are very real to them. Um, you just have to be aware of safety measures, right? Because those giant TVs, if your cat is pouncing at it, can, can certainly fall and, and be a safety hazard. Um, and they've done studies with shelter cats looking for ways to enrich them where, you know, they have a television screen. And what they found is sort of linear movement. Um, they will follow that for a period of time, but they're going to habituate to it if it's on too long. Right. So every that's kind of true for a lot of cat enrichment. If you just leave something out all the time, it's boring to them. It's not exciting. Um, and the other thing about, you know, using an iPad or using the television is there's not that ability to actually capture something. And that's going to be the same as, as the laser pointer games. Right. They can seek and they can seek. And yes, we've talked about how that hunting behavior and the stalking and the seeking is super important in play and mealtime. Um, but they actually do need to complete that sequence at some point. And if all we're doing is stimulating the seeking part of their brain and the hunting part without end, any end to that work, that's going to cause a lot of frustration. So if we're using later laser pointers, we always say we end on a treat or a toy so they can actually capture it. And so that's going to be the same if you're playing some sort of iPad game and your cat is constantly, you know, grabbing and chasing and then it just goes away. Um, that's going to lead to some frustration as well. So always end those with a treat or a toy as well. You know, uh, Hillary points out that uh, her cat uh, likes playing with the dog. Dogs and cats don't fight like cats and dogs all the time, not hardly, first of all. And and I think it's 20% of people with multi-pets uh, now have at least one cat and at least one dog living together. So it seems to be a trendy thing to do. But moreover, I would argue we were talking about cat introductions. I would argue if the cat has had no previous bad experiences with the dog, depending on the dog, it might actually be easier to introduce a dog to a cat than a cat to a cat. Can you comment on that's that? A, that's an interesting point, Stephen. I, I, again, I think that's gonna depend on the dog and depend course. on the cat. Because I think, I think what you might be getting at is that the resident dog is probably not gonna signal and get territorial over the resources because they the resources probably aren't as shared right the dog's not sharing the litter box not sharing a food bowl or water sometimes a water bowl or purchase scratching post so where you get in trouble with a lot of multiples of cats is some territoriality or some resource guarding of things that are important to them and what's important to a dog is often very different 
than what's important to a cat. So you're not going to be vying for those resources. So you think you may be onto something that some, in some sense that may be true. You're also not going to see a lot of social display in the same manner that's threatening from a dog to a cat, as you might see from a resident cat to a dog. So that hissing, that you know, big body, or even that more confident territorial body posture and kind of puffing up to show them this is mine, <laughs> I'm not sharing. Um, I think a, a normal dog who is not afraid of nor predatory towards a cat is probably not gonna do those those same things. But, you know, clearly you have to watch out for a size differential and making sure a dog is actually comfortable with the cat. So we, you talked a little bit about the introducing a cat to a cat you know, behind the closed door and, and taking your time. What are your favorite ways to introduce a cat to a dog? Yeah, well, beforehand, I always ask lots of questions about, let's say it's a, you have a dog and you and you want to get a cat, um, or even the other way around, is if this is an adult dog, I want to know everything about their history. And I really, to me, I feel most comfortable knowing that that dog came from a foster home or another home or place living with a cat safely, because it just takes a split second for that to be a disaster. Um, and so I wanna know, and if that isn't possible and you really wanna join these households, then then I'd wanna have a really, really safe way. And, and some shelters will have a resident cat that's very confident, cool, calm, collected, not gonna be flustered by the sight of another dog, where we'll have that cat sort of in a, in a, kit, a kennel in a quiet room and we walk the dog on the opposite side of the room just to see what their reaction is, to see a cat that is safely separated from them. And if that, if that looks okay, they're not hyper-focused, they're not super aroused by that, then we allow the cat to walk out while the dog is safely on leash away, just to see if when that cat moves, do we get any of those predatory behaviors of stalking, staring, or do we see fear aggression where the dog is barking and putting its hackles up and really upset because I would not want to bring that dog into a household with my cat if I saw that. I also don't want to make my cat the poor guinea pig to find that out if my cat's not used to dogs either. And so really getting that history of, I, I really encourage people who have a cat and are looking to add an adult dog to, to try to find an adult dog that's lived safely with and comfortably with cats. It's a known. So that factor's out of the way. So assuming that's out of the way, um, if you are bringing, uh, say, a new dog in or a new cat into your dog household, I, I encourage people, whoever the newbie is, make their world small at first. And so that's going to be a, a room, a separate bedroom in a quiet area of the house. The dog does not have any access to, not even right up against the door, right? There'd be a baby gate so the cat, a dog cannot be right up against that door. And what we're going to do is over time is we're going to first introduce scent. So I like to do scent exchange and also scent associations. And so that's, I love like getting those little stretchy one size fits all gloves and we're petting the cat. And then we're leaving those gloves out for the dog to investigate. We're petting the dog leaving those gloves out for the cat to investigate. I don't recommend rubbing these all over the dog and then rubbing them all over the cat because that's kind of a violation <laughs> to some cats from their perspective, but at least introducing that scent and maybe sprinkling a few of the cat's favorite treats or a little bit of tuna or play associated something positive first with the scent. And if the cat is smelling, seeming positive, showing comfortable, cool, conflicted body language when exposed to that scent, then we're going to expose a little bit of visual access. And by that, I mean, we're cracking the door with the dog far away behind a baby gate. <laughs> and so, and ideally we found something that cat has a preference for. So is that a favorite treat, a favorite toy, food item? And we're associating the side of that dog with that pleasant object. Yeah, I'm using that, utilizing those principles of um, counter conditioning or classical conditioning. And then over time, we're allowing a little more visual exposure, still allowing the cat to have the choice. Again, that keyword choice, to retreat, and to move away, and to say, I'm not participating today, and that's okay. We never want to force the issue. And over time, we give the cat the opportunity to have full visual exposure where they're still at a distance, a baby gate, or a barrier, so that dog is far away. And over time, we give that cat the opportunity to move closer and closer. Again, I love the use of lick plates where I smear tuna or chicken baby food all over a plate, and I allow the cat to lick it because it takes time. So their brain is processing, hmm, there's a dog over there hopefully in a calm state, owners have worked on that. And my brain is processing this wonderful feeling of pleasure as I'm licking this food. And if the cat's more toy motivated, then it's a game of play. And we're over time, we're increasing the amount of visual exposure we have until we see a cat essentially begging to get to the other side of that gate, right? We see them at the gate. You see the, the best clue I love
love to see from these cats is that they start to rub against that baby gate. Like I really want to have access. So they're sticking their paws through. They're trying to reach out for that social interaction with the dog. And again, we're doing the same thing on the other side of that gate with the dog, trying to encourage calm behaviors, rewarding them for the sight um, and sense of, of those cats. And then the first time we're allowing them to interact without a barrier that I really encourage people to have their dog on a leash just for, for safety, especially if there's a big size differential. Um, and that even once we feel like we, we've seen really positive interactions, we have friendly, relaxed behavior on both the dog and the cat's part, we always want to have choices for the cat. So there's still, I'd love to have a room or a space where the cat and the cat only can access and they can retreat and have all their needs met. So food, litter box, scratching, post purchase, um, access to water, fountains or running water, um, if possible, um, that they can retreat. And then in any other room of the house. So if you have a large house, it may be they've got to go up a flight of stairs and around a corner down a long hallway to get to their haven. If for some reason they're feeling that they need to increase social distance from the dog, there should be perches and hiding places in every room of the house. And I know a lot of us, we love to have cats, but we don't want to look like a cat household. So we don't like those ugly cat trees. You can get really creative. If we don't, if you don't want your cats on your furniture, if you don't want them on the back of your couch, um, then we need a perch or a shelving. And you can get very creative in stuff that has really great aesthetics. Um, I'm sure, Liz, you've talked about the, um, the architects that created cat furniture, um, the, the cat library. I mean, there's all sorts of creative ways to have beautiful cat perches and accessories so that your cat has the ability to get up high to be hidden um, or at least on a periphery of room to increase their a few weeks ago i had a dog if needed even if things are going I always want them to have that choice a few weeks ago i had kate benjamin on um from house panther and she has if you go on house panther the most beautiful Frozen. climbing alternatives uh for cats so it doesn't it doesn't have to look like a carpet covered cat tree if you don't want it to um house panther has amazing right. things to look at well they do have amazing things you know we're just about out of time again the book is decoding your cat there we go i am <laughs> or don't there we go i am so grateful that first of all you asked me to do the introduction but moreover that the book is here because we've only touched on very you know the surface of what's in this book so thank you thank your colleagues for doing this i believe it will save lives as i believe decoding your dog actually has saved lives there are veterinarians who are watching this and veterinary professionals. This is for your clients. You know, it could be for you too, but but it's for your clients. And uh, it will dispel myths and it comes all from the experts and it's all based, Dr. Bales, on I'm about to say your favorite word, I believe, on science. Yes. So I want to thank you very much uh, for consenting to do this. And I, I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Bales. You know, it's always a pleasure for me to talk with you. I think we're talking to Dr. Marty Becker next week, maybe. Yeah, we're still still nailing down a, a date and time, but uh, hopefully we will be talking to him late this week or next week. Sounds good. So thank you all very much. If you have further questions, uh, you can ask me and I could forward them to uh, Dr. Heron. Ah, sorry. <laughs> but I actually, I, I know she wouldn't mind. Uh, thank you all very much for tuning in as well. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank night. you. Bye-bye.